Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Again, our apologies for the delay, uh, which means our time will be a little tighter today, so we'll have to move along. I want to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. As you know, the center was established as, uh, as the official monument to uh, President Woodrow Wilson in 1968 by Congress. Uh, and we abide by the, uh, the principle that, uh, that President Wilson put before us of trying to combine the, uh, the worlds of ideas and the worlds of policy. Uh, and today is a, a great, great example of, of that, uh, that uh, 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 theory being put into practice. Uh, I'm really happy to look out over an audience like this with, uh, with so many uh, friends and friendly faces and, and, uh, and, and new friends who I think are going to bring us an awful lot of information, a lot of insight on the issue that's before us as we look at China and Africa, what's at stake, a look at development, economic, and business issues. Now, I'm not going to speak at all to the subject because we have a house full of experts on that, but let me begin uh, by, by a couple of welcomes uh, for, uh, for uh, some special guests we have here today. We do have Joe Gildenhorn, who is the chairman of the board of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'd like you to greet him for us. Thank you for being here, Joe. Also, we have the ambassador from uh, uh, Nigeria, Ambassador Edifuye. Uh, welcome, Your Excellency. And the ambassador from Benin, Ambassador Ogwen. Welcome, Your Excellency. Um, our objective here at the, uh, the Africa program and the uh, Project on Leadership and Building State Capacity is to help engage and inform those who will determine policy directions in Africa. Uh, on the development side, there are a few issues that are more important than the one we're going to be speaking about today to understand the dimensions and the impact of the Chinese presence in Africa and how the United States should respond. Um, to do this, uh, we... Uh, uh, we seek to uh, reach across the spectrum of uh, stakeholders who are engaged, knowledgeable, and impacted by these developments. And I'm very proud today uh, to, uh, to have uh, uh, in our presence and co-sponsoring with me today uh, two of those organizations. Uh, we're a think tank. We look seriously at these issues in an academic and a research way, and, and, and we think that's very good and very useful and, and, and necessary. Uh, but uh, I have with us the major uh, non-governmental development institute in Africa, Africare, uh, represented here by uh, Darius Manns, who will be speaking in just a moment, and the longest standing uh, community based constituency and Afri advocacy group, uh, the Constituency for Africa, and my old friend Mel Foote. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to make some opening remarks uh, before we move to the program side um, and before we ask uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, who's the managing director of the World Bank, to give us some opening remarks to start our conference. Um, and before that, uh, Robin uh, Sanders, who is a former, uh, just re returned ambassador uh, to, uh, to, for the United States and Nigeria and a career foreign service officer and also an old friend, um, uh, will be, uh, after that, she will be introducing the panels and getting us into our work for the morning. Uh, I'm not going to give you uh, uh, extensive bios on, on Mel and uh, Darius because they're in front of you. Uh, I think you all probably know them pretty well anyway. Uh, Mel, of course, is, uh, is uh, the uh, founder and president of the CFA, the Constituency for Africa, and he spent his life in Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer, working for Africa actually in the beginning as a representative, and, uh, and now also has founded the African American um, Unity Caucus. Uh, there are few greater advocates for Africa than Mel. Darius, uh, who will uh, speak after Mel, uh, is, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, an economist, as you know, president of, uh, of Africa now since 2010, and was most recently serving with the uh, Millennium uh, Challenge Corporation, including being its acting CEO for a time. Um, he has 30 years of development experience in Africa with the World Bank, the World Bank Institute, and the MCC. Uh, with those words, I will turn it over to Mel to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Greetings and best wishes to all. Uh, due to time, all protocols are indeed observed, ambassadors. <laughs> uh, I first want to congratulate the people of China on the occasion of the new year, you know, the year of the rabbit. <laughs> and on behalf of the constituency for Africa, I want to also thank my colleagues here at Woodrow Wilson Center and Africare for their collaborative efforts in organizing this important forum today. I especially want to thank my dear friend, Ambassador Robin Sanders, uh, you know, who has been the real taskmaster and the, the driving force behind all this. Uh, Robin is small in stature, but when you, she's driving something, it's going to happen. And uh, I can see why she, she was our ambassador to Nigeria. Um, 
it's been a real joy and a very interesting to see how a prominent Washington think tank like Woodrow Wilson, a uh, leading African development agency, Africa and uh, Africa Education and Policy Group, CFA, could work together to pull this. Uh, it's been a joy, but it's also been very interesting because what I've come to understand is that everybody has their own perspective here in Washington. And um, just because we're all working in Africa, we, we approach it from different angles. It's kind of like China, Africa, and the United States, when you think about it. We all have our own perspective on things. Um, I think the timing of this forum falling on the heels of President Hughes' visit to Washington is important. As we all know, here in China, with this booming economy, has rapidly emerged as a major player in Africa, especially in the critically important area of infrastructure development. This rapid expansion of China's interest in Africa, heavily tied to securing raw materials, is forcing a radical rethinking of U.S. interest and strategy in addressing Africa and African people. While some want to criticize China for its aggressive approach to Africa, the reality is that African nations have grown weary of the Western style of insisting on democracy, human rights, and good governance with limited improvements on the ground. As many African nations continue to face the fear of ongoing marginalization and impoverishment, they have come to realize that they have other choices that seem to empower them in ways that have not previously been available to them in dealing with Western governments and Western institutions. These are, no doubt, changing times in Africa and the world. I think with the speakers and panelists that you will hear from today, a lot of good ideas will surface as to how the United States, China, and other countries can most effectively partner with Africa in ways that benefit the people and promote sustainable economic development on the continent. I will now call on my good friend and colleague, Darius Manns, who is the president of AfriCare, to make his opening remarks and to, and, and to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great pleasure for AfriCare to be a co-sponsor, along with the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Constituency for Africa, of this unique forum focused on one of the major Africa policy issues of today, the relationship between China and Africa and its implications for the United States. We at Africa are working with many strategic partners, like our co-sponsors today and the private sector, to bring voice to this key issue. A rising and transforming China needs natural resources, and Africa needs development. For the United States, Africa is also strategically very important. A prosperous and secure Africa is a vital strategic interest for both the United States and for China, and indeed the whole world. We are very honored this morning to have as our opening keynote speaker the Managing Director of the World Bank, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala. In addition to being the recipient of AfriCare's 2010 Distinguished Humanitarian Award, she brings a wealth of experience to the table on these issues that we'll be discussing during the course of the day. So I look forward to a very productive discussion, and ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ogonjo-Iwala. Well, thank you very much, um, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as Mel Foot said, and as we say in Nigeria, all protocols observed. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, say how um, exciting it is uh, to be here and to discover the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center in, its, in this building. I always knew about it, but didn't know you had such a vast empire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad and, you've discovered us. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, also to thank Africa um, and uh, the Constituency for Africa and Woodrow Wilson Center for putting this together and for inviting me. I want to acknowledge Mel Foote, a true friend of Africa, uh, Ambassador Sanders, uh, who bore with us in Nigeria for quite some time, and uh, my good friend uh, Darius Mans, uh, who is a friend, a colleague, and whose passion for the continent is, is known by many. I think that the uh, relationship between China and Africa continues to attract a lot of attention. Um, of course, uh, we all know it was one of the topics for discussion during the recent trip of President Hu to the United States. And both President Hu and uh, Obama agreed to work together to support Africa's development. The communique following the trip read as follows, quote, the two sides will also, in partnership with the multilateral development banks, explore cooperation that supports global poverty reduction and development and regional integration, including in Africa, 
to contribute to inclusive and sustainable economic growth. On the side of the World Bank, we've tried to cooperate with both the Chinese and the U.S. in thinking through how we uh, get this relationship to move forward. And uh, we signed an MOU uh, with China's Export Import Bank and with uh, the Ministry of Commerce in trying to see how we can work with them uh, to try and move a Chinese, uh, China's programs in Africa forward for the benefit of Africans. It's not been an easy um, uh, uh, movement uh, in terms of activities, but we keep working at, at it because we believe that there's mutual benefit for Africa, for the uh, a multilateral development bank uh, like the World Bank and for China, for us to try and broker, you know, co uh, partnership in implementing activities and projects uh, uh, on the continent. Um, in, in less than a decade, uh, uh, and I, I, I would like to say, uh, incidentally, that in the recent uh, 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 replenishment of our concessional uh, grant and credit arm, uh, IDA, the International Development Association, where we were able to raise $49.3 uh, billion, that China played a prominent role uh, in, in being able to accelerate payments. It used to be an IDA recipient. And one way you could, of course, contribute uh, to, to, to the developing countries is if you can pay forward uh, what you owe. And they did so handsomely to the tune of $2.3 billion. In contrast to the $50 million which they had, uh, you know, they had contributed in the 15th replenishment. So this was a way for China to participate in this replenishment uh, uh, in a big way, and half of that money, of the $49.3 billion raised, and therefore by implication half of the $2.3 billion that China put in goes to Africa. So this was a major uh, sort of uh, milestone in their multilateral engagement. You know, they've been engaging bilaterally, but multilaterally they've stood back and been a little bit suspicious. So this was an indication uh, that they may be changing their way of thinking and also trying to engage with Africa through the multilateral channel. In less than, than a decade, uh, China-Africa trade has expanded from U.S. $8 billion in 2003 to U.S. dollars $107 billion in 2009. And China is now Africa's second largest trading partner after the European Union. And the trade volume is expected to ex exceed $110 billion in 2010. Similarly, China's foreign direct investment, according to figures from the Ministry of uh, Commerce, uh, China data, uh, FDI into Africa reached 9.3 billion in 2009. So China is already a big player on the continent and is bringing in investment, trade, and aid. So the debate is no longer, you know, should China be there? <laughs> I think we are past that. <laughs> You know, China is there, and we know that its role is going to become more prominent um, uh, as, as, as we move on. And therefore, I think the, the discussion that we need to focus on is what should be the nature of this engagement. You know, many people in fora that I go to still bring up this issue of should China be in there and why should it be, and uh, we are past that. So what should be the nature of the engagement. I think that's what we should uh, uh, focus on. And, uh, and uh, quite rightly, uh, you know, how should it work? But more importantly, the question that is asked by this forum, what is at stake in this relationship for Africa? But also what's at stake for China? And those are two things uh, I hope to, 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 to speak to. For Africans, the key question is how to manage the China-Africa relationship to make it truly mutually beneficial. Now, the Chinese have already pronounced that, uh, you know, what they're seeking in Africa is a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, so this may sound like a, a cliche, but the fact of the matter is that Africa wants and need, needs a relationship with China that is based on shared interests. We certainly, from Africa's viewpoint, do not want to recreate a patron-client type of relationship as existed with our former colonial masters. We want a relationship based on equality and on win-wins in terms of cooperation, and I believe those win-wins exist. So the cardinal point is that Africa and China must deal with each other on an equal footing. 
But this won't be possible if Africa doesn't, does not step up to the plate and state what it wants in the relationship. Today, I think the Chinese know what they want to get from their relationship in Africa. And by the way, it's not just natural resources. They've been in some African countries for years and years before the last decade's boom and focus on natural resources. I think it's a bit more sophisticated than that. I think they want to build long-term relationships with a continent that they see is up and coming and that will be a center of industry and commerce and enterprise for the future. I mean, the Chinese think long and they think forward. Mm -hmm. So people who are looking at Africa and saying, well, not too much going on, that's not the way they see it. So they are trying to build a deeper relationship, is my opinion. Yes, a lot of it has to do with natural resources, but I think it's more than that. They know what they want. I bet you if you talk to the Ministry of Commerce and Finance and the Chinese leadership, they have a strategy for Africa, and they have a strategy for each and every country they want to go into. The question I have for Africans is, do we have a strategy for mm. China? Mm. Is there any African country, if you called on them today and say, what is your approach and strategy to China? Could they show you what that means other than an opportunistic way of dealing with these countries, So I th with China? So I think that's what Africans need to think about. The reason why many of our relationships with our former colonial masters and the West did not succeed is that often we didn't have an approach. We didn't have a strategic view to deal with many of these countries. If we don't get our house in order and start thinking what is our strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, we may find ourselves perpetually on our back foot. And that would not be a good way to continue this relationship, which I believe is going to be a deep one for the future. So there's a lot at stake for Africa. And I believe that the central thing at stake for the continent really is the very growth and development of Africa. What is at stake is the very growth and development of the continent and the model of growth and development we want to pursue. Let me push that a little bit. Bef Why do I say this? Before the crisis, Sub-Saharan Africa had been growing fast before the financial crisis. And we all know the figures. We were approaching 6% growth rate and projected to do better. This growth was mostly attributed to four factors. Improved macrofiscal discipline in most of the countries, low interest rates in the U.S., which encourage FDI towards uh, countries, high consumer demand in the U.S. and other developed countries for developing country exports, and also increasing demand from emerging markets for developing country exports, especially demand from China. During the crisis, as demand and FDI from developed countries dropped. Demand for China, from China for commodities accelerated. This acceleration helped Africa manage some of the negative impact of the crisis. While exports to the EU dropped by 4.5% in 2009, and those to the US dropped 1.6% in the same year, exports to China grew by 3.5% in 2009. This compensated some for the drop in exports to the usual markets for African countries. So the ability of Africa to diversify markets helped it manage the crisis. And as a result, Africa was able to re weather the downturn uh, much better than it would have. And uh, it's also been able to bounce back. Usually when we have this kind of crisis, we find that there's a lag for Africa to recover about a year. This time, Africa has bounced back. Faster, And I do believe it's because of those four factors I, me I mentioned, the good policies which were pursued even during the crisis with finance ministers stating they would not step back from good policies, but also the ability to have diversified its markets and, uh, and to be able to rely on, on, on a market like China's uh, to, to, to uh, weather the crisis. So um, th that, that's the point. I want to make in saying our very growth is at stake in the way we deal with China. So if we can convert the relationship with China to a strategic one for us, where China is helping us diversify our trade, where it is helping us, you know, diversify our own economies, 
so that it's not just a question of growth, but growth with jobs. If we can work with China, so it's not just an issue of their interest uh, during this boom period in commodities, in extractive industries, but also in looking at the African continent as a place where as they move up the value chain in terms of their production and become less competitive for certain items, they can move into those African countries that have put their house in order in terms of the investment climate and be able to set up manufacturing in those countries. We need to persuade them that, look, our model of development needs to include the creation of the development of these industries that are labor intensive, some of them, where China may no longer be competitive, but that create jobs on the continent. That, because the extractive industries where they are engaged quite a lot now do not create jobs. And what we need on the continent is growth that is inclusive and is job creating because of the bulge of youth that we have to deal, contend with on the continent. So that is why I say that our growth is at stake. We have to figure out how to attract China into more value chain type of development activities and more investment in areas that will be beneficial uh, for us. But even on the extractive industries, we also need to ensure that we are getting our, what is due to us, a rightful compensation for the natural resource exports. And this means that in terms of our bargaining power, because if we get what is due, we can also replow these resources into the diversification of our own economy. We can also finance our infrastructure, a lot of what China is doing now. But if we do not know how to negotiate, if we do not have the right teams across the table from the Chinese teams, if there's this asymmetry of information where the people negotiating with us have more than information and knowledge about what they want to extract from us than, than we do, and we don't have the expertise, either legally, economically, or financially, to get a good deal, then we will lose out. So even within the extractive industries, there's still work to be done. We should insist on open, transparent negotiations and deals that our populations, our civil society, can understand. If we have to batter, let's make sure we do the calculation and be very explicit about what this means. So this is important because China is the vanguard of emerging market investment in Africa. If we don't get it right with China, Brazil is on its way, so is India. And of course they will follow with the same kinds of bargains and relationships. I can tell you when I was Minister of Finance in Nigeria, we received a huge Brazilian delegation that was interested in, in, in trade with us and investment. But the proposal they had to make was the batter of oil for all sorts of other goods, aircraft and so on and so forth, to purchase from Brazil. No problem. But I wanted us to sit down and calculate the terms of trade, what this would mean. And this caused a little bit of discomfort. Of course, course I'm always the naughty one who is putting <laughs> things on the table. And I said, look, this is all very well and good. But for us to understand whether this deal is good for Nigeria, because we can't just go into a batter without understanding. Let's sit down. And this is why I urge all the African countries in dealing with China where there's a lot of this trade. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying know the terms. Mm -hmm. Do the calculation so you don't set precedents that other countries will walk into, which may not be all uh, to the advantage uh, of the, not our leaders in Africa, but the people uh, of the continent. So uh, we need to work with China differently so that we can use their services, their interest, their willingness to cultivate a relationship with this market of a billion consumers to the advantage of African countries. And as I want to emphasize again, so that we can set a precedent for Brazil, for China, for other emerging markets 
that are coming forward. So China's interest and investment in Africa should be a means to help us diversify and further reform our economy, not a means for us to pull back into less open and less transparent and non-reforming relationships. I often hear African leaders say, well, you know, if you don't give us what we want, we'll go to China. Mm. <clears throat> and I think that that should not be the attitude. The attitude is, here is how we are reforming, here is how we are willing to do business, and we want China, US, the EU, and all those who want a relationship with Africa to come to us on these terms. That is the way we need to manage the relationship. Now, what about China? What's at stake? It's not just that things are at stake for Africa, but I believe that there's a lot at stake for China in this relationship as, as well. And I believe there are two things at stake. One, it's a reputational stake on the continent. The second is a financial and economic one. On the reputational side, if China manages the relationship with Africa well, if it manages to convince Africans, not our leaders, but Africans, that it is in there for the right reasons, that whilst helping Africans to diversify, grow their economies, it can also benefit from it, and that this is the real reason it, it's there. If China manages to do that, that is a very big bonus for China's reputation, and I strongly believe that this is what China should be aiming for. There are far too many people who are suspicious of China's motives. And sometimes there's no need to be. I mean, China has been in some countries for years, helping countries grow rice. In my own country, they had more than 500 experts at one point in time, just plugging away, trying to help us improve our productivity and production of rice. They've helped others with railways and other types of infrastructure before the commodity boom began. But they need to convince, because the recent face of China is one that is there to extract from Africa. So there's a big reputational issue. The second one is an economic and financial stake for China. I was invited recently by the Chinese Mining Association. Uh, to my surprise, I just got an invitation to come and address them in Beijing at their conference on responsible investment in Africa. And I said to myself, wow, this is a golden opportunity. Mm. What I heard was that they don't understand why they are criticized. African leaders have never told them they are doing anything wrong. On the contrary, African leaders that they interact with seem to feel they are doing things right. So what is all this noise by the West and others about? So come and talk to us about what we are doing and whether we are doing it right or wrong. And this shows you that there's an open, opening and a realization on the side of China that there are things and there's room for dialogue. So I took that invitation. There were 4,000 people in the room. Well, 4,000 is nothing in China, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little drop. <laughs> Compared to... <laughs> But more importantly, guess who chaired the meeting was Li Keqiang, who is billed as the next prime minister of China. So that's how important it was. And I took the opportunity of speaking to the Chinese about what is at stake for them economically and financially. And here's a little bit of what I said. The investments that China is making in Africa now are investments that are not movable. Once you invest in a mine, it's there. You can't take it anywhere. You invest in other commodities. It's difficult. They, they're there. You invest even in a road. Therefore, in doing these investments, it's incumbent that whatever agreements are made are seen by the people in which in the countries where investments are taking place to be open, transparent, and to their benefit. Because when the regime changes, guess what happens? The Chinese companies invest in, and China itself could receive a very strong backlash in which it could lose not just its reputation, but the money invested. So in both financial and economic terms, it could be a, a loss for them. 
So there's every incentive to engage in a relationship that reaches beyond the leaders and it's more open and explicit and engages the population because a lot is at stake economically and financially. As you all know, sometimes when leaders change, agreements that have been written are, what, torn and put aside. And new agreements more favorable to those in power are drawn up, isn't it? And if the population with which you're engaging don't know what is in it for them, you don't receive any sympathy. So I try to explain that in engaging with Africa, it would be important to observe five core principles, which are, in fact apply not just to China, but to any country engaging in, in Africa or any investor engaging in Africa. And the five principles of responsible investment that I try to point out are very commonsensical. There is no magic. The first is to align investment with countries' development priorities. So when you come to invest, ask yourself, what are the priorities in this country? Does this accord? Because if they do, you will have greater buy-in and greater support. As I've said repeated, repeatedly here, practice transparency. Third, promote value chain development. Don't just think in terms of extraction, but think in terms of how you add value to whatever sector you're in and create jobs so that you can engage the young people, the women in the country. Pay what is due and do what is right. This is a code word for don't pay bribes. <laughs> pay taxes and not bribes. In the long run, this is what pays. And engage with the local communities you're in. Don't close yourself off and supply every service to yourself, but engage with those around you. Draw them in into what you're trying to do. And to the extent that you can make them part of your endeavor and your enterprise in making sure that whatever you invest in to make your workers comfortable, they too see some other side of that in corporate social responsibility. That is also a very good thing. So these are not, this is not rocket science. This is just common sense. But I believe that pro, for being simple, what I wanted to do was get across a simplicity and straightforwardness in principles that everyone could follow that this is the kind of approach that will ensure that for China, it maintains its economic and financial stakes in these countries and avoids pitfalls. But as I said to the Chinese Mining Association, this also applies to any investor that has the interests of the country at heart. So I believe that this relationship that we are talking about, China-Africa, Africa-China, they have some very fundamental things at stake for both sides. It's not just Africa that has to watch out and put its house in order, but China also needs to approach the relationship with its eyes open and with adherence to some very fundamental principles that engages Africans. So this is really what I want to leave with you. I'm hoping that these few words are going to feed into your sessions and stir debate. Is this what is really at stake for China? How should America relate to this? Should the U.S. continue to be paranoid? Should it also learn some lessons from the way China is doing business? Should African countries just be reactive in terms of this relationship? Or how should they be proactive to make it work with them? These are questions I want to leave with you. And I'm hoping, since I have to run, that at the end of your sessions, there'll be some very nice very wise answers to these questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Okonji Iwala. Uh, she does have to run, but she's graciously accepted to, uh, to take a couple of questions and a couple of questions only uh, from the audience. Uh, as as uh, we take those questions, you'll be given a microphone. We're being webcast live, so wait for that microphone and identify yourself. So let me see some hands on these questions. I see one right back here. Yes. Thank you. We'll take both questions. Make them a question, not a statement. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
I would first of all like to uh, thank Mel and everyone for inviting me to be here. Uh, my question to Dr. Konjo Iwela is, when we talk of <coughs> China, Africa, I'm just wondering if we could also comment on African Union. So that way then, uh, instead of bilaterally engaging China, in order for Africans to engage China on multilaterally, so how is the African Union, is it capable of engaging China? Because when you look into the EU and the Americans, so they're dividing Africa into three, the so North Africa, sub saharan Africa, and South Africa, so they're trying to do this bilateral engagement. So how do we really empower the African Union so that it would be in the position to engage China's and other uh, uh, partners in this okay, area. Thank you thank very, you very much. much. Appreciate it. One more question. We'll take, uh, I see a hand right there in front of you, Ali. Thank you. Identify yourself too, please. Uh, Jolie Frank, Frontier Markets Partners. Thank you very much for your address. In the last few weeks during uh, President Hu's visit here, there was a lot of discussion, at least as reported by the news, concerning the value of Chinese currency. And could you address briefly how this uh, argument over the real value of Chinese currency should affect the strategy that you were uh, speaking of in your address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Kuhn Joel. Okay. Um, thank you for two very Im important uh, uh, questions. On the issue of the African Union, I think that uh, it's not an either-or engagement. I really think that Africa should engage in, in multiple ways. Uh, first, of course, the Chinese like to engage bilaterally, and why not? I mean, if there are particular interests they have in particular countries, countries need to put up their own strategy to see what they want to get. But I believe the AU also has the means to engage, and I think they have been engaging in a way, but have they been engaging to the benefit and productive, and pro has it been a productive engagement for us from a multilateral point of view? That's where the question lies. Remember the Chinese invited African presidents and virtually all of them, you know, went to, Af uh, to China. I think it was quite a spectacle to see these, I don't know, 40-something presidents all going to engage with one, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, they, so uh, I don't know what it says about the balance of power. If 40-something of our presidents have to fly all the way to engage with one president, they, they do the same here for the U.S. So these are things I think we need to invite Hu Jintao to the AU meeting. But beyond that, I think the AU has the instruments to do that. It has NEPAD. So I think the, what they need to engage China in, and China would be keen, is... How can they help us with some of the, the regional integration projects that we have, very specifically? You know that some of our countries will not make it. Let's be very serious. We're Africans speaking to each other. Unless we focus on regional integration. I see Ambassador Adefuye, who had been in the thick of all this, nodding his head. You know, we need to connect some of our countries. With, through transportation means, you know, in order for them to be better linked to markets. The AU could engage China on that. That's not a bilateral thing. That's a multilateral. Mm -hmm. So that would be my answer to your question. And NEPAD is there to help make that work. Um, on the issue of the value of the currency and how it affects, uh, um, uh, how it affects the relationship, well, I'm not going to enter into the debate of, of the U.S. and China and the value of the currency um, and what that means. But... You know, we, we, we think it through as well. If the Chinese currency has been held, is really undervalued in order to boost exports and, uh, uh, you know, help them grow and create the 20 million jobs a year they need to create. Uh, to some extent, when we think about it, and in terms of our own comparative <coughs> advantage, it further delays the time, you know, within which China should be moving up the value chain, doesn't it? I'm thinking of it back now in terms of the African relationship. As long as China holds its currency, manages it in a way uh, that gives it advantages uh, to manufacture and export and still be competitive in many sectors where perhaps by now it would not be, 
uh, that also has something to say in terms of Africa. We would want a situation in which China is moving up this value chain. Uh, it's align its currency to rise to the appropriate levels. Uh, because I think if you think through it, that could release some of the sectors that China is now in for Africa and some other countries, uh, you know, to engage in. And so I'm going, that's the way I approach it. So uh, I think for us, it also, uh, you know, uh, makes a difference. Um, let me just give you one direct example of that. You see what I'm wearing? <laughs> this is part of our intellectual property on the continent. We make the patterns and the designs and we manufacture them. But I have to tell you that we have become less and less competitive in doing that because the Chinese are now doing this mm. at much lower cost. Mm. So, you know, I famously go to some conferences <coughs> holding two pieces of fabric. You know, one of the same pattern of fabric. One is manufactured in my country and I, I'm a known consumer of this, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the other is a very same copy of the same fabric by a Chinese company. And when you come to the market, unless you really look properly, they look the same, but they're selling for $2 per meter cheaper than the one made in Nigeria. So this is an issue for us. And I did, when I was finance minister, I took it up with the Chinese and I showed them. You know, in fact, it went to the extent that the name of the textile company in Nigeria had been copied and set up in China, and they were manufacturing the, the same patterns at cheaper cost. So this is not what we want. And I said, look, we invite you to come to Nigeria, set up your factories so that we have the jobs and, uh, you know, manufacture for our markets. So all this can be done when the value of the currency also plays into the comparative and competitive advantage of the, the country. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kitch. Thank you. Sorry. Enjoy. This is much more fun than what I'm going to do. Robert. Oh, yes, we want it. They want one photo. Um, I don't know where your photographer is. Uh, where's the photographer? Quick, quick, quick. Yeah, that's, that's important. Yeah, okay, thank you for reminding me. Uh -huh. Let's, uh, shall we do it over here, I guess, because... Okay. Where would you like it? Where would you like it? In front of the African. Yeah, come on. Oh, okay. hey, the African. Okay. No, okay. Would, you, would you don't mind? Don't like this? Okay. Yeah. 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 Where's Joe Wilson? There's... Yeah, would you like it? Would Joe Wilson's there? Look at us all. We're right in this corner. Yeah, come get in this. Hello. Who are you? We have been doing all along. Thank you for your ideas. Okay. Very nice of you. We will talk later. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Very good. Oh, we were talking. Okay, we're inviting the Ambassador Sanders now to kick off our morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Robin Sanders and currently serving as the International Affairs Advisor to AfriCare. Uh, today we have a couple of goals. First, I'm going to invite the first panel to uh, the head table, please. All members of the first panel. And I'll continue with the scene center. Our goal today is to have an overview and a perspective discussion about the development, economic, and business aspects of the Africa-China relationship. As many of you know, this is a key topic of the day for any of us who consider ourselves not only friends, but also stakeholders in supporting Africa's uh, efforts to develop. 
There are a couple of operational things I want to highlight. Can I first ask people to turn off their cell phones? I also want to remind you that we are web streaming live, and there is a still photographer who will be taking pictures around the conference center this morning. This is a half-day event, and we have two distinguished panels today who will provide a solid overview of where they see things are, where they see things are going, and what the way forward might be. The goal is not two-dimensional. The event today is not about the U.S. and China relationship per se, but how both countries help and assist Africa, keeping in mind that it is not a zero-sum game. We will begin with our first distinguished panel entitled Overview of the Development, Economic, and Business Relationship that will be moderated by Mr. Stanley Strauter, Chairman of the Constituency for Africa. Mr. Strauter will introduce his panel members. The idea behind this panel is to put some things in perspective, particularly now as China is the second largest economy in the world, passing Japan, where four years ago it was number four. It has a reported GDP for 2010 of 10.3 percent. On the other hand, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa has been noted recently as a key emerging market with 20 of its 37 economies expanding and the rate of return on foreign investment in the region is greater than any other area of development. In addition, the potential annual revenue by 2020 could reach as much as $2.6 trillion when combining the possible outputs in agriculture, natural resources, and infrastructure development. And let's not forget the other key areas for the future, the environment and alternative energy sectors, as China's Solar Valley and Dezhou Solar University are being listed as one of the top world centers to focus on clean energy, coupled with Africa's resource account, which is reported to be 24 percent of the continent's GDP. All of these figures you can find on McKinsey, Washington Week, and Energy Now. The second panel, The Way Forward for Africa, the U.S. and China. Here the goal is to be prospective on the key issues relevant to today's event and highlight not only what is next in the Africa-China paradigm, but whether the U.S. should be a factor or not in the Africa-China relationship. And also, what are some of the new areas of engagement, such as the capital market sector? Each presenter will have about eight minutes to make their presentations, and they will take questions in groups of three. And I turn the floor over now to Mr. Strader. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your um, helping us to organize this. And I want to publicly thank uh, Africa and also the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting us to be a part of this great event. Um, I'm not going to read everybody's bio. I'm, as uh, Steve said earlier, the experts are here, and you came to listen to them and not me. Uh, I just uh, want to thank, um, uh, first of all, the first speaker will be Ms. Roy Lazier. Uh, most of you know her. We also had the benefit of calling her a great friend of ours, and in, in, her, ex in her current uh, professional relationship, she is the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Africa at the Office of United States Trade uh, Representative. So without any further ado, Lori. Thank you. Well, good morning. I am really pleased to be here to uh, have been asked to attend this um, very timely event uh, organized by the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Constituency for Africa and Africare, and I'm delighted to see so many uh, friends and supporters of Africa um, throughout uh, um, uh, the room. Um, and uh, all protocols uh, observed. Um, I especially, though, want to just um, commend all of us who continue to focus on what is it that we need to really be doing with Africa, in Africa, um, not for them, but with them. Um, let me just say, we welcome China's growing economic engagement with Africa and this engagement, in our opinion, is helping to provide African countries with, with much needed investment, new markets for their products, and assistance in modernizing their infrastructure. 
Both the United States and China are active in these areas, and our approaches to Africa may be different, but we believe that we share some common aims and can support African efforts to use trade as an engine for economic growth. That is key. And I'm just going to begin with some brief remarks on the trade-related aspects of Africa-China relations and then talk a little bit about U.S.-Africa trade and the implications of uh, China and what they're doing there for the United States and for Africa. Trade between China and Africa, as Dr. Kunja Awela said, has grown substantially over the past decade. Although China has always played a role in trade and investment in Africa, in recent years the role has expanded and taken on a more complex character, as she was saying. Current China-Africa two-way trade is estimated at more than $100 billion, and between 2000 and 2010, China's share of trade with Africa rose from 1.7 to 3.8 percent of China's total exports and from 2.4 percent to 4.5 percent of its total imports. The relationship between China and Africa has contributed in part to African development, particularly in relationship to infrastructure and the development of natural and mineral resources. However, China's trade with Africa is largely resource-based. Chinese demand for mineral resources and raw materials such as oil, chromium, cobalt, copper, and iron far exceeds Chinese supply. Accordingly, China relies on imports from Africa to fill that gap. China's principal demand is for oil, and Africa currently accounts for about 30 percent of China's total imports of crude oil and oil products. China offers African countries specific trade preferences also to encourage trade. However, African countries still do face escalating tariffs for value-added goods, something that uh, Dr. Kanjewela was talking about, the importance of these value-added goods. And the value-added goods in areas like coffee, cocoa powder, roasted cashews, has actually discouraged some of Africa's exports of those kinds of value-added products to China. Now, we all know that trade can be a powerful tool for lifting countries out of poverty, and Africa's ability to produce and export growing amounts of competitive value-added products to large, rapidly growing economies like China and India and Brazil will be critical if Africa is going to capture more than the current 3% of world trade that it currently has today. Now, there are some sectors, and when I travel to Africa, one of the things I really enjoy doing is going to factories, actually getting out in the field and seeing what are they producing and what are they trading with us and the rest of the world. And so some of these sectors, like apparel and footwear, where China is currently the largest supplier to world markets, we believe that as wages rise in China and China moves its economy towards producing higher value manufactured goods, Africa may become a growing supplier of those same kinds of products, footwear, apparel, um, and those kinds of things. Perhaps China, one idea that we have been thinking, and perhaps the Africans have also strategically been thinking about this as well, is the fact that China may be able to provide some technical assistance to help Africa grow more competitively in those sectors where Africa will now be a growing supplier to the rest of the world. A major challenge for Africa is increasing its production of competitive value-added products to trade, whether with China, the EU, the U.S., or the rest of the world. Low manufacturing capacity in Africa, as well as supply-side constraints like high energy costs, poor transport infrastructure, customs, and other cross-border barriers have to be aggressively addressed if Africa is to take advantage of existing or future market access in the global trading system. Africa also needs more support for its regional economic integration efforts as a means of stimulating economic growth by creating larger markets, improving economies of scale, and reducing transaction costs for local, regional, and international trade. 
Let me just touch a bit on U.S.-Africa trade relations. The United States trade policy towards sub-Saharan Africa is based on our firm belief that trade can be a powerful engine for lifting countries out of poverty, creating jobs, and giving people hope for a better way of life. It's also based on our view that trade cannot be seen in a vacuum and is connected to a number of other issues such as democracy, good governance, and human rights. The African Growth and Opportunity Act is one of our main tools for promoting increased trade with Africa, especially in value-added products. And AGOA is providing today duty-free entry into the U.S. market for just about all of Africa's products from the eligible countries. AGOA has helped to increase both the volume and diversity of U.S. exports to Africa, from Africa to the U.S. For example, non-oil imports from Africa under AGOA and GSP has more than doubled from 2001 to 2010, rising from $1.4 billion to over $3.7 billion. Some of the leading non-oil imports under AGOA and GSP include apparel, vehicles and parts, ferro alloys, citrus, chemicals, wine, nuts, cocoa powder, and fruit juices. Now, while we're pleased with the GOA's achievements, we do recognize that it has not done as much as we would like and that many Africans face daunting challenges in making the most of trade opportunities under AGOA as well as opportunities in trade around the world. And this is why we continue to make substantial and broad-based investments in building African trade capacity. Since 2002, the U.S. has devoted over $3.2 billion to trade capacity building activities in sub-Saharan Africa, funding, for example, four regional trade hubs located in Ghana, Senegal, Botswana, and Kenya. And the trade hubs are doing a good job of working with African firms in a wide variety of sectors to help them identify and develop market opportunities here in the U.S., even in Europe, and actually even on the continent. Another major focus of U.S. trade and development policy in Africa is to work to promote greater regional economic integration, and we are working with the African Union, regional economic communities such as COMESA, the East African Community, Yamoa, and SACU to try to advance regional integration. Just to touch and end up on a few business opportunities in Africa, as most of you know, Africa offers unprecedented business opportunities for U.S. investors. Unfortunately, U.S. investors are not as educated about the opportunities in Africa. And we believe that there are strong opportunities, particularly for minority, diaspora, and SME businesses. A number of recent studies and reports highlight Africa as a rapid-growing region and market and of new investment opportunities there. A September 2010 IMF report noted Sub-Saharan Africa today resembles Asia in the 1980s. Quote, the private sector is a key driver and financial markets are opening up. War is down, democracy is up, inflation and interest rates are in single digits, growth is taking off. The IMF puts Africa's average annual growth for 2004 to 2008 at more than 6 percent, better than any developed economy in the world, and predicts that the continent will buck the global trend and will be growing by more than 3 to 4 percent this year. A recent McKinsey report predicts African consumer spending will nearly double to $1.4 trillion by 2010, while the number of households in Africa with discretionary income will rise by 50 percent to $128 million over the same period. The U.S. business community, unfortunately, has been slow in recognizing and moving in on this new market frontier, particularly when contrasted with China, India, the EU, and many other countries. <coughs> but we in the U.S. government are continuing to encourage growing trade and investment between Africa and U.S. businesses. Hundreds of small and medium-sized U.S. enterprises, diaspora and minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses are trading and exploring investment opportunities with sub-Saharan Africa. Africans are seeking U.S. inputs, expertise, and joint venture partnerships, and this has resulted actually in growing two-way trade, exports, and investment. However, we recognize that there are a number of challenges and that there are a number of areas such as uh, the pitfalls of graft, 
corruption, weak enforcement of intellectual property rights, which Dr. Kundra Whaler mentioned, constraints on local capital, trade finance that is not sufficient, and poor infrastructure. African governments need to continue their reforms. They've done a lot, and they need to be recognized for that. But even more needs to be, in, be done to improve the climate for doing business there and for attracting more investment and spurring economic growth and development. So in closing, let me just say that we welcome China's growing economic engagement with Africa. The African continent is large and its needs are many. And we support the initiative of other countries who seek to expand and grow healthy relationships with our African partners. The Obama administration is committed also to expanding two-way trade with Africa and increasing investment there. We believe that trade can serve as a catalyst to build a stronger future for the people and economies of both Sub-Saharan Africa and the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I referred you to the bios of, the, of, the, of our individual guests, and I just wanted to say for our next guest, we first of all want to thank him for flying in from Canada to be here with us today, so we're certainly honored to have you. Uh, and as you look at his, as you peruse his bio, you can see that he is a uh, well-published and uh, documented scholar, both in Africa, Asia, Latin America. And I must point out, Steve, that it says here that he's a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson in, in, International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., for 2010. So we want to thank you for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to, to, to Dr. Wynn Ren Zhang at the University, uh, Director of the China Institute at the University of Alberta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, uh, Ambassador Sanders, for uh, inviting me. And Steve, thanks for having me back. And uh, it's good to be here again uh, after spending uh, quite a few months uh, at Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, uh, I was asked to uh, specifically focus to, uh, on China's perception of transparency uh, uh, in terms of its investment, in terms of its uh, functioning uh, in the African continent, uh, probably around the world as well. Uh, this is by no means a small matter, okay? We've seen all the numbers. We've talked about trade volumes. Uh, what I'm trying, I try to emphasize from our start is that if you think this is large scale, you haven't seen the big ones coming, okay? Uh, the Chinese investment uh, overall in the on the global stage uh, is really at the very beginning of a large expansion. If you think about trade numbers, uh, China, Africa, continent from 2000 to 2008, we're talking about annual 33, over 33 percent increase uh, up to 2008. And 2009, of course, there was uh, economic financial crisis dropped a bit, but China overtook the United States uh, as a single country. Let's not counting uh, EU as a bloc. As a single country, China overtook the United States in 2009 with well over $90 billion of trade vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., about $86 uh, billion. Uh, right there, the gap. Uh, and uh, last year, uh, uh, Representative Lisa mentioned some of the figures, but I look at the latest numbers. Uh, from no, uh, January to November uh, 2010, okay? The Chinese had a trade volume with African uh, continent of close to $115 billion, where the U.S. Uh, is somehow uh, sitting at about uh, $104 uh, billion. So we're looking at, in two years, the gap uh, uh, of China and U.S. trade uh, growing by you know, uh, 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 a total of $10 billion, something in that neighborhood. So that trend will accelerate, okay? And if you look at the breakdown of the Chinese trade volumes, what they do in Africa, 80% of them focusing <coughs> on the uh, mineral and energy side. Uh, very, very large volumes of imports. So uh, Chinese export to Africa is more balanced manufacturing goods in many ways, diversified, but Africa uh, export to China heavily uh, on the uh, mineral and uh, resource and energy side. That's, that's a fact. So therefore, 
how China uh, <coughs> is going to uh, behave in Africa, how Chinese investments now not only aid having a similar or a bit larger volume than World Bank uh, in the continent, but also on the large scale uh, infrastructure, resource, energy investment, how China invests, how when they invest, how they perceive the local conditions, I think it's very important for, for us to understand. Um, I want to make a few uh, points in, in the very short period given to me. One is when we say Chinese perception uh, of transparency, or when we say China's engagement with Africa, I want to raise the question, which China we're talking about? Because simply there's not a single China when we talk about China nowadays. Uh, I'm always amazed by the stereotyping in the press and when we say China, well, communist China or red China or one party dictatorship China. Uh, that is a monstrous, has a global strategy of taking over that continent. They have all the tools in their toolbox. They're just pulled out in one country after another. They do this and they do that. Everything falls together. China is up there. It's not that simple. China does have strategies. China talks about long-term strategy all the time. Um, but we also know uh, that China has many other dimensions. We see state enterprises having some good investments and some of these similar uh, good enterprises having some bad investments. Okay? Some of them uh, having good operations, some of them bad. Some of them doing good things in good places, some of them doing capable of doing bad things in some bad places. Let's put it that way. So we're talking about many dimensions of China. There's a medium uh, enterprises going to China, smaller enterprises going to China, individual vendors for those who are many of you either from Africa or traveled well in Africa. They're everywhere, okay? Street vendors, they go to Levrail in Gabon. They will be in the central market downtown competing with the locals, selling shoes, cheap plastics, whatever, cell phones. And these people, they represent quite different Chinas. I think I want to put that as a first point. Second, I think when we talk about the Chinese perception of, uh, uh, there, when you have different Chinas, they perceive transparency issues very differently. I've done field work in Zambia, in Gabon, in DRC, South Africa, and I'm going back again uh, next, uh, next month. I follow China's extractive industries and I interview people on the ground. What do they think uh, about the local conditions? And I found all sort of diversified views. And I put up a report, a major report, the only report actually, I think in existence, on how Chinese enterprises in Africa perceive transparency. This is for the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI. It is available uh, with the EITI website as well as uh, Revenue Watch Institute. Uh, we, we undertook a couple of years of uh, local interviews in Lumambashi, in Gabon, and other places, and put together that report. Uh, we found a, a diversified of views. And these views, that's leading to my second point, that is reflecting a China interacting Africa uh, with a, a key issue, not about just bilateral relations, how China of state-owned enterprise or medium or small or individual ventures go into different uh, African countries, but rather these different perceptions uh, reflect, I think, very important internal Chinese development dynamics. We tend to think about China-Africa relations or any of China's foreign relations in bilateral terms. That's including U.S.-China relations. We're not going to, going to get into that area, but I think a key important dimension of understanding Chinese perceptions uh, of transparency environment, investment environment is actually to link and to understand how China evolves, especially in the past 30 years. We're looking at often China as a one-party state uh, with central government giving marching orders, but in reality, we tend to overlook or underestimate the extremely erosive nature of the market forces that really has taken over China over the past three decades. Okay? We're looking at, if you look at China, how China evolved and developed over the past 30 years, we're looking at a very primitive form of capitalism, very cutthroat capitalism, uh, in operation in China. 
Okay, when we say China、uh, is cutting corners, some criticism they do that in China. Okay, when we say China may not pay their laborers in Africa、uh, in their investment projects uh, uh, properly as or as well, they do so at home. Okay, they pay their own workers in a very very low wage, which is what they call competitive advantage. Okay, that's the development model. They consciously adopt in order to be competitive in the global economy. We say they are not respecting environmental concerns in African countries and other places. They don't show much concern at all. After all, inside their own country, most of the rivers are polluted. The so-called "build first, develop first, clean up later" mentality is still very persistent. So China is not kind of some kind of a monster or racist. They go to other places to destroy them and preserve themselves. They do exactly these things to their own country, okay? And they have realized the peril of the what I called a modernization, traditional modernization development paradigm, put on steroids in the past thirty years. Okay, so it, the internal dynamics of Chinese capitalism, or the capitalism with Chinese characteristics, if we put it that way, really is actually putting China. Into a situation that, if by pure structural forces, if we look at this monster called China, if you can call it one China, the logic of current development is to subject its own country as well as African continent and other places、uh, to this logic. And in, according to this logic, China's current development needs. And export needs and continuous 10 percent per year development needs would subject Africa as a pure energy and resource extraction base, nothing else. That's what it is about, okay? And that's the capitalist logic. And by the way, the Chinese needs for its own development and ex, as,、uh, as factory of the world and its export export drive are partly or mainly driven. By us here in North America, in Europe, because more than 60 percent of China's exports are procured and produced by foreign multinational corporations in China for the purpose of export. Okay, we don't consume fewer refrigerators or air conditioners. Okay, we just move the production base to China for the purpose of export back. So China, as an engine of the world economy, driving in part to feed us, and in the process they go around the world to Africa and to Latin America to extract all those energy. So that's this logic of internal development. At the same time, you have a government fairly centralized, has this what I call a goodwill intention. Oh. China has an old, good relationship with African countries. That's going beyond the logic of old colonialism, who did all these terrible things to Africa before. And we want to do differently.、Uh, we have a, 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 we don't share that a, a colonial masters relations with, with with the Western white world.、Uh, we want to do better. You have this intention. You have this strategic logic saying, in order to continue to sustain China's extraction and relations with African countries, you need to give better aid. You need to give forge, forge better relations. Therefore, for giving billions of dollars of loans and putting in、uh, large packages of development uh, uh, aids. Uh, formulating political will, all these things go along, but the two, the good intentions, the government-driven, uh, uh, you know,、uh, a friendly approach that can be sustaining in the future, that kind of approach is in deep tension and in friction with the deep market market logic that driven China's capitalism today. So we're seeing this tension of Chinese internal dynamics in display. In China's perception of transparency in Africa, that's the second point. So, how Chinese perceive transparency in Africa, in particular?、Uh, a few points here、uh, we can discuss more. But one is actually this: what I called、uh, the huge perception gap of we perceive in the West, at least in the popular press, that China has all this. Uh, uh, You know, advantages government assisted,、uh, the money and the loans.、Uh, but the Chinese 
I talked to on the ground, large state enterprises, you know, oil company executives, down to street vendors, they mostly perceive China, uh, China's presence in Africa as in a so-called disadvantaged position. They don't really uh, have the historical link. They have not been there in generations like the Belgians, the French, the British, and all there. So they felt they're in a disadvantaged position. So when you are in a disadvantaged position, uh, you try to compensate by doing all sorts of other things. They feel that's justified. I think let's not painting a, a rosy picture here, but the perception gap is not, not they're not doing well. So I, I was in Lumumbashi, Congo. I mean, the local, 30, 55 to be precise, copper smelters that was built in the past five, seven years uh, uh, out there, they have no government support whatsoever. Uh, only a few state-owned enterprises, mostly medium, small size industries, five to ten billion, million dollars. They have no contact with the embassy at all. They are left alone. And they felt they were not being able to compete with the Belgian or French or other multinational corporations of the West. They don't know local conditions that well. So they feel they have to compensate more in order to create better investment and business conditions. And they will do sometimes whatever is needed. And then they feel they were singled out by local corrupt officials to extract a so-called fee. I don't know how many times I was uh, Thank you, I was reminded my time is nearly up. Two minutes, okay. Uh, quickly, let's not tell any more stories. Uh, but the second, uh, I think, um, they feel once they're in local conditions, whatever they do with their business, it's just the local conditions. That's exactly what the Chinese felt they were doing at home. Uh, they will do whatever the locals do and in order to survive. The survive instinct drive their practical uh, uh, investment and other business considerations. Uh, and, and the third, I think here, uh, when you come to large state enterprises, they tend to compensate with what they perceive to be the disadvantaged position. They're coming behind. Mineral, good concessions of oil is being taken by uh, others, uh, uh, Western companies. So they come with package deals, with long-term loans in many other areas, uh, in return for a long-term supply of oil. That's well known, do well documented. And, uh, and then one important thing what they do is basically saying uh, we want to provide low, lower cost and hard working conditions. Chinese technicians, Chinese engineers, Chinese working teams are, are more in the mobile homes shipped from Chinese containers out of China rather than seeing uh, uh, five-star local hotels setting up tennis courts before they enter into construction. That's why they can do it very fast. Uh, and they're saying, we want to be competitive. Uh, and then they are proud of that. And they have the indigenous technologies in some of the oil fields, uh, you know, uh, extractions, recoveries, that's been written off by Western companies as not profitable. But they can, they can do so by uh, being, uh, 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 in many ways, uh, trying to work their way around. And finally, uh, I think uh, they feel there's a bias and they're suspicious about initiatives such as EITI. And that, uh, last uh, November, I organized the first major workshop in Beijing uh, for EITI. Uh, after several years not successful, we finally have a major workshop. The major players were there from energy companies, resource companies, state uh, uh, officials. They openly talked about this might be something, because China is the major investor, okay, on, on the rise. All of a sudden, all these initiatives, are, are, are these the Western developed all these criterias of reporting, transparency, uh, loading on them? And, and I think those are the kind of suspicious, uh, uh, you know, uh, justifiable sometimes. Uh, they talk about that. Uh, very quickly, just a final point on number four. Other than talking about how China perceives transparency and investment environment, I think the issue is how actually do we promote transparency with the Chinese? I think that uh, the way forward, uh, I don't want to jump ahead of our futures panel, but I think <laughs> it's important to think that China's transparency, China's more transparent activities, investment, and trade in Africa or around the world has to be linked with China's transparency drive domestically. I have Chinese researchers 
who are telling me now in our team, the EITI team, saying our work on EITI, China's support of EITI on transparency, yes, good internationally, but internal transparency, reform, openness is important. So when China began to do things right at home, they are likely to do things, things right uh, in Africa and other parts of the world. Very important to think of that internal, external uh, dynamics of reform uh, and, uh, and, and openness. Uh, second, I think it's very important to be consistent, to be genuine in engaging China. Many of the people here in this room work on China, NGOs, uh, foundations, think tanks. Don't do one-off, saying we do an initiative, we do a drive, and then we do some results. It has to be patient. You do it slowly, never stop. You have to be continuous. You have to be patient. Patience is a virtue. And if you fail, don't feel set back. Just go back in a continuous basis. Uh, I think you will succeed uh, by doing so, by persuading and working with the Chinese. Uh, I think it's, we need to, third, the third point uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the promotion of transparency is don't tell the Chinese you need to do this or that because otherwise it's damaging China's you know, relations with the US or with other countries or with African countries. You need to tell them more about how good it is for China to promote transparency and how good it is for China's long-term own interest to provide a better investment environment. On all the set of debates in this town and around the world about dealing with China, we always tell China that if you don't do this, it damages our relations, it damages our internal economy, it damages American interests, it damages African interests. You have to tell them that it damages China's own interests, ranging from currency to trade <coughs> to investment environment, and China will do so like every other state when they perceive it's good for themselves, okay? And finally, the final point on promoting this, let's not assume that we can change China from outside, okay? We can do wonderful things, but it's important logic if you look at the past 30 years, we need to depend on Chinese to change themselves. So our work need to focus on promoting the reform-oriented, open-minded wings of the Chinese leadership and the enterprises, and through them, and let them change China themselves and move China forward. And that's the way China would improve its own image and transparency and investment, investment environment in Africa uh, in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you know why we flew him in from Canada, right? It was very fantastic. And I, I do want to say, I just returned from Liberia on Monday, and the point that the doctor made about what's China. I had, I had a meeting with Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, and she said, Stan, the Chinese ambassador took her to a brand new Chinese restaurant. It's not the only one, but took her to a brand new Chinese restaurant there. And, she, and he, he was gloating. And she said, I wish I could just get an American to come here and set up a restaurant, you know, the point. But if you go so also go in the marketplace, go into town, you'll see the Chinese vendors there. And the marketplace, I mean, they've come to stay. So this is uh, timely, but I think your remarks are very appropriate, so thank you very much. Let me also uh, bring to you Mr. Robert Tinsley, External Affairs and Policy Director at the North Asia Region, the Nature Conservancy. Please. <coughs> Thank you. I have flown in from Beijing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say hello to you all. Well, this is going up. Thank you very much. Uh, I work for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, being here is like a dream for me. I used to be an American diplomat. I worked for Robin Sanders in Nigeria as her economic counselor. Uh, we talked about the EITI. I was the intellectual author of the monitoring and measuring a group of the Nigerian Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Uh, I won the 
uh, worldwide award for environmental diplomacy for my work in the Middle East, and I spent seven years straight in China as a diplomat in the 1990s. So very uh, glad to be here. This is actually the first time that the Nature Conservancy is introducing our emerging China-Africa strategy to an external audience. So uh, we welcome your uh, questions, your feedback, your advice, information, uh, contacts, possibly even uh, support. Uh, I'd like to mention that two of my colleagues are here, sitting to my right in the middle, Randy Curtis, who is a senior policy advisor, uh, advising both our China and Africa programs as we move forward, and also Kirsten Patterson, who is with our Africa program. We believe that not only animals and plants need ecosystems, but human beings need ecosystems. And that's probably true in Africa as much as anywhere else. Uh, I had the privilege of consulting a couple of times with uh, Dr. Akonjo Awela when I was uh, going out to be an economic counselor in uh, Nigeria. And I really believe that she set things up very well in terms of how we, the Nature Conservancy, look at partnering, if you will, with all of those Chinas that you described, Doctor, uh, to do some good in Africa. Uh, it's also very interesting for me because I work in what we call the North Asia region, which for the moment is China and Mongolia, uh, and I'm one of about 70 of our staff, but only five of us are Americans. Everybody else is Chinese or Mongolian. So we're coming at this initiative, if you will, very much from a Chinese standpoint. In China, we are doing those things to make things work right, harmonizing people and nature. Uh, we are now introducing to the government a revolutionary strategy for managing water flows on the Yangtze River, which, if adopted, would increase earnings from hydropower, would better flood control, and would also allow for the recharge of wetlands and lakes and other aspects of biodiversity. Uh, we have a climate change program on both the mitigation and adaptation side, uh, completely linked with China's key agencies and experts, which is really changing that dynamic, and our ecological blueprint is the framework for China's national biodiversity strategy and action plan, identifying 35 priority conservation areas. Uh, I'd like to note that we're working on the ground in Zambia, Mozambique, Namibia, Kenya, and Tanzania. Uh, we're hoping that our China-based initiative can support not just the work in those areas, but broaden the impact of what we're able to do. Uh, there's already been mention of infrastructure development. Uh, we have a tool that we call Development by Design that can guide infrastructure, mining, uh, oil and gas. We are also looking at uh, illegal trade uh, affecting wildlife. Uh, rhino poaching trends. Uh, very interesting challenges. Sometimes you can uh, go after mass perceptions. I think there's been some changes in China in that sense in terms of shark fins and shark fin soup. Uh, but uh, rhino is a very difficult one because it's a more limited uh, market and it's very limited marketing channels. So you're dealing with some uh, tough actors and tough to change people's minds. Some other possibilities that uh, we're looking at, we're actually in discussions with some of the major, major actors within China in terms of lending uh, institutions. Uh, we're having conversations about possible debt for nature uh, swaps. Uh, we are very, very involved with the progressive business community in China. Uh, among our China board members are some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the country, and we are seeing where 
whether it's green energy or corporate social responsibility, recognition systems are actually having an impact domestically and could overseas, for example, in Africa as well. And we're not on the ground in Madagascar, but with support from USAID, uh, we lead a program called RAFT, which is Responsible Asian Forest Trade. Uh, we have connections where, uh, which we've offered to the Madagascar Rosewood Coalition to try and affect on the demand side uh, that trade, which is decimating the rosewood resource in that country. Um, I want to thank you all very much. Uh, glad to have been with you. There's a lot of different ways to uh, get at uh, this equation. Uh, there's been mention of uh, Chinese work crews or operations being closed off. We, we hope over time to engage with some of those operations to try and get guidelines in place in terms of bushmeat. Uh, so we will work everywhere from the policy end to really engage with specific uh, operations. Of course, we're not the only ones who are trying to do this, uh, but part of the way that we work as an organization is to work with all of the other stakeholders, all of the other uh, partners. Uh, if you want to look at our website, nature.org, just go to where we work, China and Africa, you'll see more of the details. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your presentation. And uh, I'll... Our next guest, uh, Mr. Raymond Gilpin, Associate Vice President, Sustainable Economics, United States Institute of Peace. Uh, Here? Please come forward. Thank you very much. You have a PowerPoint Uh, thank you very much, and thank you so much to the organizers for putting this on. Um, it seems as though the narrative gets retold over and over again. The figures might change, but the narrative seems pretty solid. You have two camps. One camp um, has a view that what's at stake is um, war, doom, and um, unjust um, issues in Africa, and the other camp think, well, there's some good being done, and so we should embrace it. Um, but very seldom do we sit, take a step back, and ask the important question, why? We have assumed that we know what these figures mean, a hundred billion dollars and more in trade foreign direct investment of 9.3 billion in 2009, um, workers' practices, employment. What does it mean, and are we getting the diagnosis right? And so before we go to the uh, futures panel that is looking ahead, I want us to look back a bit and just think, what are, the, what are these, what are these uh, figures actually telling us, and why are, why are they so? Um, we know that um, China has one view of Africa, and most of these issues have already been discussed. And these views are guided by the five principles of Chinese foreign po policy. They have not changed essentially since the 40s, and they, are, they explain a lot about what is going on and why both uh, trade and investment are unfolding in the manner in which we um, see them doing so. As I said, we have some positive reactions and there are some negative reactions to um, China. We've talked a lot about trade trends. Average annual growth over the time period, 33.5%, astounding. Yes, there's a lot of focus on hydrocarbons and mineral oils, but investment is diversifying. Um, it is not the same narrative that we had 10 years ago. Things are changing um, as far as this decision making in um, China and in, in Africa. Again, to the acceleration, China's energy footprint in 2001, 
by 2006, both upstream and downstream. And the downstream is a lot more telling because it speaks to the long-term nature of China's, in, of, of China's engagement. Expanding footprint, technical assistance, trade, debt relief, FDI, peacekeeping, a lot is happening. Infrastructure pro, um, projects, practically wherever you look, there is something going on. Look at Africa in the context of the global of China's global footprint. There's a lot to a, a lot to learn. But how does this happen? And are we really understanding what this means for not just economic stability but also regional stability across the continent? I have a number of bullet points. I'm only going to speak to two in the interest of time. The first, resource backed loans. Um, we talk a lot about the barter system where China barters both investment and trade for Africa's natural resources. And we think this is something that, has, that, 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 that probably sounds um, as if it has some sinister undertone. They're here to take the resources. But someone mentioned that you know, we have different Chinas, but China does what has worked for it. If you think back to the early 70s, when China was preparing to launch on this phase of modernization, it required two important things, technical know-how and investment flows. No one would lend to China. It was very expensive for China in, in the open market. What did China do? It bartered access to coal and oil to Japan. And Japan, in turn, came in and did the investment, brought the technical assistant, which is what helped kickstart um, the Chinese economy. China dealing with African countries where you have information asymmetries, you have high risk, but you have resources. It worked for them, and so they're applying it. Um, a little over a couple of years ago, I was on a VOA um, telecast to China, a phone-in program, and I had a similar um, response. Uh, we're talking about the the, the um, best way to do business, the most responsible way to do business. And a miner from northern China called in and he said, what are you talking about? Have you ever been to a Chinese mine? We do exactly the same thing here. Um, but the issue is China is very formulaic in its strategic posture. It worked very well for China and so it sees Looking back at most African countries, they are resource rich, but they are dirt poor. And so it sees in its mind, from a strategic perspective, that this is possibly something that could work. But is it being done in a way that is most beneficial to African countries? Most African countries do not do the math. They say, oh yeah, we have copper. All right, yeah, we'll, we, we, we will barter it. And then it becomes pro problematic. And so that's one important thing that we need to dig deeper into before we make leaping conclusions about what is good, what is bad, what is injurious, and what is not. The second thing I'd like to talk a bit about is the package deal. China is very creative in its use of foreign assistance or aid. Um, here in the United States, we, se we, we separate foreign assistance from commercial investment. Um, China does not. It, it, it has a package deal approach. And this, it is not just Africa. China does this all over the world. It uses foreign assistance inducements to sweeten um, trade deals. And the trade deals look a lot better than they actually are. It probably looks good on the uh, face of it, yes, you're having more foreign assistance coming. It is helping to bolster the um, the, 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 um, whole, the, the, the whole deal. Um, the, we would have not just a mine, but we'll have roads and schools, etc. But what are the issues underlying that? It is actually, if you unpackage it, it is tied aid redux. And tied aid is not good for development or sustainability. So we should ask the question, how do we package, um, from an African perspective, our approach in negotiation such that we do not, we still get the aid, we still get the investment, but it is in a way that gives us a choice, a choice about how best to target the investments, a choice about how best to utilize um, foreign assistance. 
A lot of Africa's debt is because of bad decisions made in contracting contract both commercial and concessional loans. And this is and, and, and this unfortunately persists. We talk a lot about which model is better. I'm not going to speak to this um, in detail, but I'll just say every time you're thinking about or you're analyzing both inflows, whether they are commercial or is foreign assistance, you have to ask why, what, and how. And unpackaging it in this way helps you make more informed decisions. There, in closing, I'll just say three things. Um, firstly, um, there is a basis, a rational basis, for a lot of what happens on the strategic end and Chinese side, but you can't find similar rational bases in many African countries on the other side of the table. Secondly, um, aid dependence and unhelpful investments uh, could be destabilizing in two ways. Uh, first, we have to recognize that even though right now China is at a place, is, is, in a is really in a posi posi position of advantage vis-a-vis -vis the African countries, in the outer years, should African countries become more prolific in terms of um, exports, they are China's competitors. So what foundation is being laid now? If there is no viable foundation in the outer years, what we're going to have are states that continue to be weak, continue to be aid-dependent, and unable to trade competitively. And that is the only way that we're going to see states across the African continent that rule justly, provide opportunity for entrepreneurship, and en foster a spirit that, I know human security is a much, ali much maligned term, but foster a spirit that you know, enables human security, where the average African citizen could be able to look back and say, I have an iota of confidence that my children's tomorrow will be better than my yesterday. And finally, um, we also have to know that Africa has significant structural gaps. Infrastructure is a big one. Risk, et cetera, most people don't want to do um, infrastructure in Africa. But Africa should not assume that they have a fixed menu. Many times, that's the assumption. Africa can go a la carte and have China do some of the things, <coughs> Russia do some of the things, Europe do some, and other um, strategic partners do others. But in order for those partners to take them seriously, they have to do three important things. First of all, they have to reduce direct and indirect costs to trade. Secondly, they have to eliminate distortions, particularly corruption. And thirdly, they have to plan the transition. And the only way to plan the transition within the context of today's event is to be able to fully understand not just what the business m model is that they're dealing with, but what the underlying assumptions and motivations are. And that is the only way that we could be able to say we have an end state and we're able to plan strategically about how to get there. I would really advise us to be um, excited about the opportunity, excited about expanding trade, but let's be smart about how we analyze the issues and get to the core. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I was in Liberia last week, and one of the things that the ambassador, U.S. ambassador said, Stan, the Chinese have built a hospital, but nobody's in it. There's no doctors, no nurses, and she's trying to develop the way forward to bring the U.S. expertise to put some other expertise in this uh, in this hotel. So if both fit the example. I'm, I'm going to go right to the questions, and not a lot, because as you know, we're behind time, and uh, I don't want to be too much in the way of, in the way of lunch, but let me... Uh, uh, go right to the questions if you have any. First of all, give the panel a great uh, hand. And uh, it was a great learning experience for me to have an opportunity to listen to all of you. I want to thank you very, very much. I wanted to 
I have a uh, good question, but I wanted to get the ambassador, I don't know if we even make, you want to make a remark on this before we go? Another expertise uh, here. Thank you, ambassador. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to make a few, uh, a few comments uh, since um, I, I realize that the next session will deal with some of the issues I'd like to comment upon. But I'd just like to take advantage of the fact that I have to leave by about 12 o'clock to make some few remarks. Well, I agree with m most of what has been said, but I, I'd like to make this uh, declaration a part of, I think I'm speaking on behalf of most of the African countries, and I, I think I have the support of my colleague from Benin in saying that it is not an issue of whether the West or China. For us in Africa, we need both. Our development programs, our development objectives are multifaceted and we need support from every part of the globe. Right. So the issue is we seek, we very much support the, the cooperation, the, the air of cooperation, and the fact that during uh, the, the Chinese president visit, there was some discussion about China and the U.S. Uh, support for Africa. So that's the number one. The other thing is that though we, I mean, given all the facts of the way Chinese have been making themselves present in Africa, we do appreciate that. And uh, especially on the issue of infrastructure, the one advantage has given us in Africa is that, the one advantage it has given us in Africa is that it expands, gives us ability to, to, to maneuver and to negotiate and widens our scope, our choice. I remember speaking for my country when we were discussing the issue of petroleum, petroleum investment bill and local content bill, and we were about to be, and some U.S. companies were trying to almost tell us that uh, if you don't play the board uh, like we want you to do, uh, you might lose customers. We have to tell them that, look, we are not, we are not, we are not, we are not uh, short of other people demanding this kind of thing. And of yes. course, our people had in mind that the Chinese have been knocking on our doors for this kind of thing. So for us in Africa, the, the Chinese presence gives us the ability to maneuver and to have a wider scope for seeing cooperation. But like I said, we need cooperation of both China and the U.S. and the West for our developmental projects. The, o the one thing I really want to stress is that um, uh, Ms. Lizard from the US State Department mentioned the connection between development and democracy. Uh, that is one thing that I agitate the mind of many of us in Africa about the Chinese presence in our continent. The very fact that the, there should be, the Chinese should be able to recognize the fact that there's a, there's a link between political stability and economic prosperity. And that in making their choices of, of the support in which the, the modality of their aid and support, they should respect our feeling for some element of political stability in our continent. Not many of us are, are happy with um, the activities of China for some time in the fall. Many of, we are not very happy about that. Two, as I'm speaking now, there was, a, there was a, an ECOWAS delegation that came last week on Côte d'Ivoire, and we are seeking a United Nations Security Council resolution on Côte d'Ivoire. But one of the two countries that are giving us problems in getting this out, getting this, achieving this, are the Chinese. And in any case, whether if you are only uh, in, interested in economic development, if there's no political stability, you cannot achieve anything. So we're appealing to them, and not many of us are, are happy about um, the, the kind of support, the, the association between them and President Mugabe. And so we know in Africa that, yes, we want development, we want stability, we want progress, but please note there's a nexus between political stability and economic prosperity. Without that, and, and support us when we want to, uh, we want to advance the course of democracy. And the, all this fuss about uh, the, some people have been making statements about uh, the quality of Chinese goods. Maybe that's part, that's part of our problem. Our standards organization should be able to make sure that the goods they bring to Africa are of the right quality and the same quality that they bring to the U.S. So but that, that, it's still part of the problem. But you should also see it from that perspective. The goods they bring to us in Africa should be of the same quality they bring to every part of the world. But then we welcome the Chinese, and it's, uh, it's for our people at the, AU, at, the, at the AU level to deal with the Chinese. And let us let the Chinese please know that collectively we want to deal with them, but it doesn't pay us when they kind of play a positive divide rule and deal with our countries, small, weak countries on the bilateral level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador.
Thank you very much. We're going to take a couple, get, maybe we can get, raise two questions or three, and then I'll let the panel do that and we can break uh, and go right into the next panel, okay? There'll be no break, but we can go right into the next one. Ambassador, please. Next. Thank you. I uh, enjoyed the panel very much. Many very thought-provoking comments. Question for uh, Dr. Winron. Uh, you noted the correlation between Chinese domestic policy as well as business practices and its impact on activities abroad, in particular in this case, Africa. Uh, how, and you also mentioned the growth in uh, Chinese trade and investment with Africa. Uh, someone else earlier noted uh, the issue of pressure from the West in terms of the value of Chinese currency. How would you project the impact on Chinese trade and investment with Africa if over the next five years there is an appreciation in the value of the currency? Thank you. Um, one, uh, right there. Mamadou, right there. I'm gonna, we're going to take three and please identify yourself. Yes, Mamadou Bey from uh, Chevron. Uh, I have a question uh, for uh, uh, Madame Lizer. You mentioned during your speech that uh, U.S. investors are not educated about opportunities in Africa. And looking at uh, some of the, 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 the discussion we had here previously with uh, Dr. Ngozi and with what uh, Raymond Gilpin also mentioned, what are the reasons why U.S. investors are not looking at the opportunities in Africa while the Chinese seems to know what's happening and also the Indian and the Brazilians coming? Why is it that the U.S. companies, especially the small medium enterprises, not the Chevron or the Exxon, uh, uh, but the small medium enterprises, why they are not investing in Africa? And what are the instruments that the Chinese government is putting together that the U.S. government cannot? How can we talk today about unemployment in the U.S., about crisis in the U.S., while we, we also know, especially the policymakers, that there are real opportunities? So how can you help U.S. small medium enterprises to invest with the kind of instrument that you can put together to allow them to go? Thank you very much. One more, and then we'll, uh, right here, and then we'll uh, have the panel engaged. My name is Herbert Weiss. I'm uh, associated with the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, and my focus is the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, and I'd like to pick up the comments that were made about BARTA and speak exclusively about BARTA, which is a major piece of the exchange, the commercial exchange between the DRC and China. An element of BARTA that has not been mentioned is what impact it has on the African society that has engaged in it. And since we all know, uh, certainly for the Congo, uh, that uh, corruption is a major problem, uh, the thing that is a great advantage in BARTA is, to put it very briefly, I know you want very quick comments, uh, you cannot deposit a road in a Swiss bank. And that's the key to the whole thing. Now, none, none of the speakers spoke about the division of wealth within the African countries that gain that wealth through international exchanges. And it seems to me that the Chinese are gaining an enormous advantage through BARTA, where it is applied, because it is inevitable that there is what we call in the West trickle-down when you use BARTA. And when you sell concessions for money. That money at best stays in the capital city, but more typically ends up in foreign banks in private accounts. Okay. Why is it not possible for the West to copy this model since we claim to be much more interested in the general welfare of those societies, including democratization? then the Chinese model, which is basically purely a model of exchange. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to do a little, I was going to say three. I'm going to do one more. Uh, Nancy, because no one's talked about education in the whole panel, and I wanted to make sure that's important to all of us. So, Nancy, please a introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Stan. My name is Nancy Overholt, and I'm with the Institute of International Education. And I would like to um, ask the panel to address the development of not infrastructure but human capital, the capacity development of exchange through education. Um, and um, understandings which can address uh, a variety of what you're talking about, and particularly the demographic bulge to which <coughs> ambassador, uh, the ambassador referred um, not too long ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Let us begin then with uh, Dr. Yang responding to the question of the impact of uh, trade on trade and investment of the currency, uh, Af uh, Chinese currency that was raised by amb by an ambassador. Yeah. Okay, th uh, thank you. I think that's an uh, important question here. The bigger picture uh, on the uh, Chinese currency or renminbi or RMB or yuan, whomever uh, you, you choose to, whichever you want to use that, I think uh, the bigger picture is that in the past five years, uh, the RMB versus U.S. dollar has appreciated by 22%. Many people actually don't seem to remember this is the fact. Uh, in this capital, especially, that political exchanges get re very heated. China get into domestic politics. Congress would accuse uh, China of uh, manipulation. Uh, the Obama administration would like certainly to see China as RMB appreciate more. I mean, uh, one thing we know, if by tomorrow some people advocate Chinese currency going up by 20 percent, we know there is one significant indicator will change that is the strength of the Chinese economy. It's going to be much closer to the U.S. size uh, than simply just last year, as we know, by U.S. dollars, uh, you know, measurement that surpassed Japan as the second largest economy. Uh, but let me go back uh, to the internal dynamics of the RMB debate in China. I think, first of all, the RMB has been appreciating, although not as fast as the Americans wanted, but you have to see whether you can do more in the Chinese domestic context. Uh, China, we're talking about millions of people, jobs <coughs> at stake, okay? I grew up in China, and uh, I, goes back, I go back to China all the time. One of my trips over a year ago is back to the northeast part of China, Harbin, that's where I was born. Many years, I have a friend I have not seen, and he came to the gathering, and the first thing he mentioned is, he said, I Googled you before I came, and you have written to advocate China uh, increase the value of currency, uh, 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 of RMB. He said, let me tell you what I say. I said, he said, I'm in charge of the Heilongjiang provincial textile industry. Every 1% or 2% of increase of RMB means the lose, losing jobs for the very, very thin margin local textile industry. He said those vulnerable mothers, mostly women in the textile industry, will lose their jobs. And he said, I don't care about macroeconomics or whatever you political science sit there in the Western office and write about. All, all what I care is our workers need jobs. So I'll fight from the local perspective. That leaves me an impression that you have domestic concerns that's very serious on how China manage its own RMB situation. But I think in the, f in, in the broader context, back to the African context, the argument is that a strengthened, I think the RMB will continue to strengthen, a strengthened RMB will increase China's purchasing power a lot more, okay? China now with $2.5 trillion of foreign reserve, about a third of global total reserve and leading the rest of the pact by a big margin and increasing. And at the same time, holding about $900 billion worth of U.S. Treasury official, non-official bonds, they feel very vulnerable with the quantitative easing tool, unless limitless printing of dollars. They know the U.S. dollar value is going to go down. So they want to invest in tangible assets, that means energy and resources around the world, to diversify just enough, but not to cause a panic. Because if China leaves the U.S. dollars, China's own value 
uh, investment will go down. So China would uh, strengthen RMB, will increase China's purchasing and import power, but China will lose on the export mar market. In the long run, the macroeconomist, good friend of mine who is sit, used to sit on the currency commission in China, he, his advocate is that China should do so in its own initiative for its own good. Uh, the strengthening of RMB will increase China's import uh, uh, cap capabilities while balancing out on the long-term loss of jobs on the export sector. So we're looking at Africa now. In China's foreign trade is just over f overall 4%. Not that big, but China's foreign trade in Africa is over 10%. So okay. any move in RMB, very important for African continent. So we need to watch Thank that you. very closely. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Vizier, the next question was directed to you about U.S. investors in Africa and why, why aren't we there? Right. So, first of all, I think it's a great question coming from a large company that has a history in, in, of being there. Um, I think the issue is really public perception of Africa. It is changing, but it is not changing rapidly enough, and there are a lot of organizations, um, the Africa Society and others, that are trying to do a better job of, uh, not a better job, but to actually do the job of making sure that the American public doesn't just see Africa as the place where their children who are starving. How many of you have seen those commercials with, you know, the little boy that's crying and, you know, the bellies are swollen? And if all that um, the American people generally think of Africa is that it is a place where, um, you know, we send aid. Uh, and they don't know um, uh, that uh, Africa is uh, full of 54 very vibrant economies um, with uh, investment returns that are really high, uh, then they won't. If I could just, on that point, this is why the diaspora is, is really so important. Um, there is an ITC study that uh, came out recently about SMEs as a part of the government uh, 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 program on SMEs, and a larger percentage of U.S. SMEs are engaged with Africa than any other region of the world. So we believe that that is because there are people who understand those economies, know those economies and countries, and will invest. In terms of U.S. tools, we have um, organizations, you know, the Small Business Administration, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, the Export-Import Bank. There are a lot of U.S. tools for small businesses to invest in Africa and to do business with Africa. But the problem is is that they have to have people coming to them with bankable projects that they can then look at and, and, and financially support. So those two things, I think, will rise together. The people who are interested in doing business with Africa and investing in Africa as uh, um, U.S. agencies and others support um, that increased uh, engagement. Thank you very much for it. Let me just add one of the things I set out, and in, in when I went to Liberia last week, it was a trade mission, by the way, and one of the big problems for U.S. firms that are trying to do business in Africa is that they can't beat the Chinese firms in the, in the bids, the World Bank bid, you in, they can't beat them. And so uh, the ambassador, while she recognized this, she still has to deal with this and counsel uh, U.S. firms that come to try to bid on bridges and roads and whatnot, counsel them to be patient and keep trying. Uh, so it's a distinctive uh, disadvantage for U.S. firms. We don't have all of the tools <laughs> necessary to make us competitive in the marketplace. The next question uh, related to my colleague's uh, question about bartering. And uh, as I like the way you put it, you can't put a road in a Swiss bank. I love it. <laughs> you know? So the question, I, somebody has to please uh, 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 direct them, have an answer to this question, or why isn't that's one of the things we should be considering in our relationship with Africa? Mr. you want to try that? Yeah, and, uh, uh, um, excellent question. As I said, um, we have to be both innovative and creative in the way we do business with Africa, um, largely because there's this information asymmetry that makes it difficult to, you know, do normal type of business and in investment, but also because um, of Africa's comparative en endowment. At the moment, it's natural resources, and you're right. You can't put um, you can't put a road in a Swiss bank, 
but you could put um, some of the proceeds from the road in a Swiss bank anyway, uh, because we see a lot of these tenders uh, subject to significant amounts of leakages. But as a model, it is worth considering. It's not every time that it has to be cash or um, financial transfers. There could be times when we actually help fill this, <coughs> this glaring infrastructure gap in Africa, and that is one, one way to do it. Um, but whether you do it um, the way it's currently done or whether you do it as an optional um, <coughs> alternative in your menu of um, possibilities, what we sh Africa should avoid is blind barter. We generally sign the contracts, we generally reach the agreements um, before we count the costs. And when I say count the costs, I don't mean just count the cost at the point of signing, I mean count the cost over the income stream of the, uh, of, of the, of, of the um, engagements. And um, very few countries do this, and when you, if you, because if you review a number right now, because of EITI, a number of these um, agreements are in the public domain. If you review some of the agreements and you quantify the relative impact, you would see that most African com countries are disadvantaged, and it should not be so. So blind butter is not good, but butter as an option in a broader menu, absolutely. My, my last question gets us follows right on that point. I'm going to ask Dr. Young to speak to it, the one about human capital and the development of human capital. All of us can take a crack at it, but I wanted to uh, have you start us off on this question of human capital. Okay. Um, uh, briefly, the issue here, I think, if we can refer to the Chinese uh, experience or model, um, the Chinese have been uh, able to have a very well-educated uh, workforce at a very low cost. I think that explains a lot of, of the Chinese competitiveness. We're talking about the textile industry, China's export. You can have the Chinese going to build things. They're competitive, talking about bidding process. They're doing engineering and technical work as good or even better than the Western firms, and yet at a very low uh, wage. I think the lesson here is, is not how much African countries in its engagement with China to formulate strategies of selling this or that. Uh, that has to be sustained by to what extent if you are a country primarily exporting oil to China, like uh, Angola, Nigeria, some others, or copper in the case of Congo, how do you in the process to accumulate some of these uh, uh, profits or proceeds and to invest in your own human infrastructure. We're talking about a lot of physical infrastructure. <laughs> Absolutely needed for anyone who traveled in Africa. But human capital, at the end of the day, is really making uh, the country in the long run competitive. Uh, other than the uh, physical infrastructure, I think the lesson here is very clear. And back to the question about DRC, when I did the case studies, a number of trips to uh, the southern part of Congo, Kantaga pr province, I talked to the provincial agriculture uh, <coughs> ministry officials. Here is the response I got. None of the provincials treacherous, huge mining profits have transferred over the years to agriculture sector. So when I went to the mines to look at the Chinese investment along the way, what I found is a desperate need for infrastructure and agriculture products. You got water, you got good land, and they're telling me in the provincial government saying, no Chinese, no Canadian agriculture aids are coming. We need those more. And there was no transfer of these wells. So how do you build your own human capital without having a well-educated uh, 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 population? I think the long-term uh, uh, question for all these resource-rich countries uh, is how do we invest inside your own country and to build up the capacity 
to be competitive in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Ambassador? Uh, I, I just had one thing that, that, that I think is really critical in terms of human capacity, which generally I think has not been focused on. Africa has a lot of well-educated people in, you know, uh, uh, some of the, the um, sciences and, and, and arts and so forth. But um, what I think is lacking is um, the uh, capacity and the human know-how in productive uh, areas, manufacturing. Just so, so as an example, um, uh, and, and, and I, I'll stop after that, in, in a conversation that we had with President Johnson Sirleaf, and she was talking about the fact that she was really um, frustrated by all the years that Liberia had been exporting pretty much raw rubber and that they did not make a, a plastic fork um, a uh, Tupperware or condoms. These are kind of her words. <laughs> and 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 what we were what we were talking about and is relevant to this um, issue is what what kind of capacity do you need to be able to establish a manufacturing facility that can take rubber and make it into any of those items that that President Johnson Sirleaf mentioned. And I think in Africa, as they are looking at becoming bigger players in the global economy and making more value-added products from their raw commodities instead of shipping so much of that to others like China and China creating the jobs and making those products into uh, finished products, there needs to be a focus on what are are the skills, the uh, uh, expertise and information that is needed to um, add value to Africa's own products. Thank you. China wants to be in Africa forever. Therefore, China needs the reputation, needs to pay the environmental cost of responsibility, but doesn't want to lose the short-term competitive advantage by paying the cost. An idea that we might present to some of the key Chinese actors is, okay, how about if China goes in and works with African governments to raise the standards for everybody? It's a very small investment for China to get the legislative and human capacity in place to raise those standards, which are in Africa's advantage, clearly, but also in China's advantage for the very long term. Thank you. you want to make some last remarks? Um, just on, in, in this context, I, I have, um, over my very, very long life, um, <laughs> traveled to or visited 45 African countries. Wow. I have seen helicopter pilots serving, Chinese-trained helicopter pilots serving as clerks. My only thing is capacity building is good, but within this context, there has to be choice. And um, usually with the um, bilateral capacity building, we take what is being offered. And usually what is being offered is not necessarily what would stand African countries in good stead for the next stage of their development. So that would be my only word of caution. Thank you very much. Could you give the panel a good hand? We